guest speaker. Um, he's an Associate Professor of Health Economics at University College London, and his main research interests are in the development, assessment and translation of statistical methodology in health economics. Supported through individual fellowships and methods grants, his contributions span across several areas, including statistical methods for cost effectiveness analysis of cluster randomised trials, uh, missing data methodology, uh, and uh, econometric evaluation using large-scale electronic health records. He's been recently awarded an NIHR Advanced Fellowship to exploit target trial emulation, a causal inference framework for estimating treatment effects using real-world data in health technology assessment and policy evaluation. His other interests include health economic evaluations alongside trials and observational studies with particular focus on digital health and mental health. He led the development of methods uh, guide for Public Health England on the economic evaluation of digital health products. Um, in addition, he's a member of the International Society for Health Economics and Outcomes Research, ISPOR, expert group on statistical methods for health economics and outcomes research, and is an associate editor for Value in Health and an editorial board member for medical decision making. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Manuel Gomez uh, join us today and open our seminar series. And his topic is uh, statistical methods for economic evaluations alongside cluster randomized trials. And just to remind you that at the end of uh, Manuel's presentation, there'll be at least 20 minutes for questions uh, and discussion. And what we'd like you to do is to keep on mute until that point. Um, and then you can either post your question in the chat, or if you prefer, use the uh, reaction and the raise hand symbol, and you can ask your question. And Richard Norman will be um, chairing the Q&A session at the end. Thanks very much, Manuel. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, for the kind words and opening up the session. And, you know, it is a pleasure to open up this seminar series. I, I must confess I wasn't aware of uh, the focus being on methodological issues or general topics, but very happy to, uh, um, to present to, uh, to this audience. Um, as, as you mentioned, I probably will spend about 30 minutes uh, or so um, on the semi on the slides and then um, give plenty of time uh, for people to ask questions. There will be different related topics within the cluster trials. So hopefully uh, there will be plenty of areas that people can touch on and, and ask questions. I think it, it work better that way because um, this topic is one that I work um, so probably the first methodological area uh, I work within health economics. I'm an economist by training, um, but then sort of got closer and closer to health economics um, as an academic. And I think cluster trials was the first area that I really uh, immersed myself into um, as a proper health economist. So, uh, so uh, hope, hopefully I still remember all the details, um, but I think that sort of discussion at the end will definitely help bring out all the, uh, the things that you might want to, um, to know or, or to discuss at the end. So, so I'm going to spend, as I said, the, the, the next few minutes talking a little bit more about cluster trials and economic evaluation uh, of cluster trials, um, then spend um, uh, the next uh, few slides on the statistical methods that we proposed um, for addressing the clustering in, in, within the economic evaluation studies. Um, and move on to other issues related to uh, um, the analysis of cluster trials, but uh, probably more niche um, or some niche, some, some others not so uh, much, um, like the informative cluster size, which might not, might or might not be present in your trial, um, but missing data tends to be. Uh, 
pervasive so what so is usually uh, always there and and uh, the analysts should should deal with it right so um why we use cluster randomized trials i mean we might um, do it for different reasons we might be evaluating a, a group level intervention such as changing uh, incentives at the provider uh, level or very commonly as well, we might want to avoid contamination between the different treatment groups. And so, yeah. oh, that was a bit noise. Um, or then avoid um, contamination between the treatment groups and the cluster trial does that very well by assigning uh, individuals within each cluster only to a specific treatment instead of multiple. Um, and so the, the key feature of cluster trials and probably the reason why I spent my PhD uh, working in this area is because the type of clustering that we find in other areas such as multinational, multi-center studies, etc is different. So here the randomization is by cluster, uh, not the individual. Um, and, and leads to uh, uh, some sort of dependence within uh, the cluster. So individuals within a certain group are more or more likely to share some of their characteristics and therefore the variance. Um, but not only the characteristics, but also the contextual features, the care they receive, for example, um, and other things. So, and that sort of within cluster dependence um, sort of breaks one of the classical um, assumptions of for linear regression uh, about independence. And, and therefore, it needs to be recognized, not only when we're doing the analysis of uh, the data at the end, but also, and, and obviously, uh, clinical units, they, they know that very well. You need to recognize that at the design stage, for example, when you're calculating your sample size. I'm sure you're all familiar with, with uh, cluster trials, but for those who aren't, uh, here's a quick uh, visualization of what the difference is between multi-center trials and cluster trials. Mm -hmm. So within a, a, a standard multi-center trial, within each cluster or, or group or center, um, individuals are randomized to different treatment groups. So uh, um, here, uh, the, this picture only shows control and treatment, but if you have more uh, treatment groups, they might um, be assigned within the same center, for example, a GP practice or a hospital. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so individuals might interact within that group. Whereas with cluster trials, um, because is the GP or the hospital uh, or the setting that is randomized, all the individuals that are then recruited within that cluster, they receive the same treatment. So that is of interest, as I said, if, if we want to evaluate the cluster itself or something related, the intervention related to that cluster, or if we want to avoid contamination because then within each cluster, um, all the individuals will receive the same treatment, so no, no possibility of interacting uh, individuals from different treatments. So at the time, I mean, this is now 10 years old, um, but at the time when I sort of uh, scoped the literature, um, there was a lot of, of studies that they either ignored the clustering or perform some inappropriate type of analysis. So for example, within the economic evaluation, they were still doing some sort of cluster level summaries, which in some settings might be sufficient, but not in economic evaluation. Um, 
And so we, we use the Ponder study, which is present sort of reported in this table as an example uh, to, uh, of, of how, thing, how things can go wrong uh, by not performing any clustering adjustments. So we have, uh, in this case, things like incremental cost, incremental quality, and then them put together and the probability of being cost effective. And you can see that although the incremental quality didn't change much in this case, both the, both the, the, me, the sort of mean incremental and the standard error um, uh, for, for uh, associated with, with that parameter uh, made a big change to the probability of being uh, cost effective. Um, and, and this intervention was a psychological intervention for postnatal depression um, for women after their first baby. Um, and so th this was just to illustrate that um, we want that there was a need to improve uh, practice in this area because most people were sort of either overlooking the clustering when, when uh, doing the economic evaluation or for those that were not, they were doing a, a sort of a, a not uh, appropriate or, or sort of not fully appropriate job uh, at it. So, um, so at that time, we, we, uh, and, and that the, although this was PhD work, it was part of a wider uh, medical research council. Um, project so so we, we we propose sort of three broad types of methods um and the first one is probably one that health economists were uh, were uh, very, sorry that there's a bit of echo if, if people can mute themselves. um so it was a method that health economists were um, very familiar with called the seemingly unrelated regressions. And a sort of a, an easy way to account at least for uh, the clustering, the standard errors is to use a robust sandwich estimator within that framework. And that's, that's sort of the method that we started with, not because we thought he was doing um, a, a sort of uh, uh, the, the, the best adjustment possible, but because it was something that people could immediately do and, and conduct with their standard um, software packages. Um, and, and so what this method does is, is sort of uh, a joint uh, model uh, assuming vivariate normality and then when so you in, in the variance estimator, it just includes this um, sandwich estimator to allow for um, the cluster, um, clustering, sorry, uh, within, uh, within those groups. A more sort of a fuller adjustment for clustering and, and obviously multi-level models are not necessarily new. Uh, they've been used in, in other areas, including um, education, um, quite widely, and and so th the difference between the multi-level models and the seemingly unrelated regression, or, or th the main difference, is that the multi-level models actually so partition the variance into different levels, the uh, individual and the cluster, and assume those cluster-specific effects uh, follow a sort of a random effect denoted by, by U. And so in addition to the individual error terms that follow a vivariate normal distribution with a, with a seemingly unrelated regression, now we have an extra component of the variance covariance matrix for the, uh, the this specific cluster specific error, uh, a random uh, effects U. Um, and we also assume that in the is they follow vivariate normal distribution, but needs not to. Sorry, uh, people could mute themselves. There's a bit of echo. Uh, 
you Thank say uh, uh, okay um so um so, so so the clustering is is then properly propagated or the uncertainty related to the cluster is properly propagated through this um random effects um you properly account for the individual level correlation between cost and effects at both level the individual and the cluster level uh with with the both parameters uh there um, you can incorporate both individual and cluster level covariates, although in clinical trials, you're probably most concerned with any adjustments for individual um, covariates for increasing precision and for subgroup analysis. Um, and as I said, you know, I'm presenting here by very normal uh, distributions, but it can be extended to others. And uh, uh, at the end, I, I leave you with some papers that actually did that. The last set of uh, approaches that we um, uh, that we proposed was around bootstrap. And the reason why we did that was because both the seemingly unrelated regression and multi-level models um, they were still sort of doing some uh, parametric assumptions around the distribution of the data. So we wanted a method that was fully non-parametric, um, and the, we wanted to bring that method to uh, uh, to this setting to a to account for the cluster. And so we 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 uh, took bootstrapping, which people are, are very familiar with in health economics. And all we did was trying to adjust it or, or adopt it to, uh, to recognize the clustering. And so we, um, we, we draw or we drew uh, on, on um, the sort of the, the theory around uh, the bootstrap and two stage bootstrap within cluster trials. Um, and, and we built this algorithm that can recognize um, the, the clustering and the correlation between costs and effects um, for, for this setting. So I, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on the algorithm is, is in this paper if you note, if you want to learn a bit more about it. Um, but the key aspect of it is before you do any resampling with a bootstrap, you have to calculate this what we call these shrunken estimates. Um, and only then you start bootstrapping um, observations. So you calculate the cluster shrunken means first, uh, and X is the, uh, the cluster shrunken means for the cost, and we could do the same for the effects. Um, and, and all these parameters are defined at the bottom. Um, so you calculate the cluster um, shrunken means, which basically cluster specific means, and standardized residuals around those means, okay, which are denoted by Z. Um, and once you, uh, you've calculated those, um, or once you have applied that shrinkage, um, then you start resampling. Um, so first you resample those cluster level means and then the individual residuals, okay? Um, another key point on, on this algorithm is that for the resample stage, once you do apply the shrinkage estimator, uh, you combine each cluster with the residuals drawn across from all clusters. So you kind of, in this last step, you kind of ignore the clustering. Um, and this is done just to avoid double counting the clustering, okay? So th this is an important step. Um, then you repeat um, th th these steps one to three for each treatment group. Basically, we separate um, the, the, um, the bootstrap by treatment groups to recognize potentially different distributions between treatment arms. Um, and once we do that, we bring it together uh, in, in a single bootstrap sample and compute the stats of interest, such as incremental endpoints. Um, 
and then as, as you usually do, you do that thousand times um, or 2000 times to construct the full bootstrap distribution. So it sounds a little bit complicated, but it isn't. Once you apply the, the shrinkage uh, and, and combine the cl those cluster means with the residuals, it sort of follows very um, typically like uh, non-parametric bootstrap. So we sort of compare uh, at the time these, these studies um, and and obviously, as, as you would expect, uh, methods that ignore clustering. So for example, if we apply the seemingly unrelated regression without the robust standard error, we'll be underestimating the uncertainty. What that means is that the standard errors will be um, too small, okay? And, and your confidence intervals too narrow. Now, what we found with uh, when we apply the, the, the robust standard error with the seemingly unrelated regression, and, and we knew this from theory, but what's good to, to confirm is that it performs poorly when you have less than 20 clusters. So as a minimum, 10 clusters per, uh, per arm. Um, and, and that's because the, the, the sandwich estimator relies on asymptotics and when things come below 20, um, it starts deteriorating their performance. Uh, both the multi-level model and the two-stage bootstrap perform well. Um, and by well, I mean uh, they, they provide the unbiased and precise estimates and the confidence interval coverage uh, was uh, very close to nominal levels, uh, 0 0.95. And we, we did a quite comprehensive assessment across um, realistic settings within um, economic evaluations of cluster trials. And so, as I said, one of the reasons why we, we went for the bootstrap was because we were a bit concerned about the normality assumptions of the multi-level models. But actually, um, in, in those simulations, when we tested uh, the multi-level model with, um, for example, skewed cost data and no normal um, EK5D distributions, uh, they were relatively robust to, um, or the, the multi-level model was relatively robust to departures from normality. And the, it might have been the case because we were interested in the uh, incremental measures. So for example, incremental cost and incremental quality. And as long as things were relative, of, even if they were uh, sort of uh, skewed or no normal, if there was not much difference between arms, then because we were interested in the difference between arms as our um, parameter of interest, then it didn't really affect much um, the, the performance of the multi-level model. That might have been one reason, um, because usually um, normal-based uh, methods and regression methods, they tend to be inefficient when the data is not known. Right, so, so that's it in terms of broad methods to, to capture the clustering. Uh, in terms of additional issues, I'm going to touch on two, the informative cluster size and the missing data. So the informative cluster size, as I said, it might not be necessarily uh, present in all cluster trials. In the ones that we had at hand, uh, fortunately or coincidentally, we had that issue. And at the beginning, we we're not quite sure what was going on, but then we sort of um, drew on, on, on the theory to, uh, to identify and, and we uh, uh, investigated a bit further and found that the issues such as this one affected uh, um, the, the, the point estimates for the, the cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and, and what I'm going to say in the next two slides is also not probably not new to you, but uh, just a, a quick um, highlight on, on this issue. So the, the cluster trials tend to be uh, unblinded with individuals commonly identified 
um, and recruited after the clusters have been randomized. This is not always the case, at least with the trials that we had. And then the review that we did, um, it was definitely uh, the common thing. So the, the clusters are first sort of randomized and only then uh, the, 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 the recruitment of the individuals is done rather than being a priori. So, and, and what that leads is to a sort of systematic difference um, in important prognostic factors between arms by chance, for example, um, and there might be differential relationships between uh, those factors and the cost effectiveness endpoints. And if that's the case, um, appropriate adjustment for those factors uh, needs to be done, but is often not pre-specified. In other words, we sort of hope that the cluster design will balance things out, um, but in specifically in cluster trials, it might not be the case. And therefore we don't see these adjustments pre-specified. So more attention then needs to go to the knowledge stage. And so this cluster design is also prone to differential recruitment date, um, rates because of this post-randomization recruitment, um, which in, in other words means just clusters with unequal sizes. So this wouldn't be a problem unless that the cluster size itself is associated with the cost effectiveness endpoints. And that might be with the costs, for example, in the form of economies of scale, or it might be with uh, related to the outcomes in the form of, for example, learn by doing effects, okay? And if these associations between the cluster size and uh, the cost effectiveness endpoints differ between arms, then you will have bias estimates. So just to note that up to now, most of the adjustments for clustering were reflected on the, the standard errors, okay? So if you don't account for clustering, you tend to underestimate the uncertainty, but usually it doesn't affect um, the point estimates themselves and, and the bias around it. But with informative cluster size, uh, if those associations are differential between arms, then you get bias. And, and this is the main point of, spending uh, um, uh, some time around this issue and try to, to, to sort it out. Um, and this sort of, and, and what we encountered was that th there was some sort of reluctance in adjusting for uh, contextual factors such as the cluster size. You know, it, it's something that is not typically done in RCTs uh, but in cluster trials, we found that it might be needed uh, because otherwise you get bias. So, and, and here's our uh, motivating example um, using again, the, the, the Pounder study. And what we, I mean, you can look at the table with, with a bit more time, but what we found was, that the cost effectiveness uh, results differ um, both according to method, but also according to the type of adjustment. And I think the bottom line is, um, if there's informative cluster size, uh, so if the um, adjustment with interaction is required because if it's differential by treatment arm, you ought to include uh, a cluster size by treatment interaction. Um, and the MLM, so the, the multi-level model uh, for this particular cluster trial um, seem to provide the best fit to the data. Um, just a note to say what TSP plus uh, sure means. So basically for covar covariate adjustment, um, the two-stage bootstrap, because it's non-parametric, is less straightforward to um, do any covariate adjustment with it. So what we did was we performed the two-stage bootstrap and then for the bootstrap samples, we applied the similarly unrelated regression on top of it just to do the adjustment within a regression framework. Um, obviously that's a bit silly because <laughs> any of the limitations of the sure uh, will probably uh, uh, reflect that. 
but we wanted to see how different that would be from the applying um, simile unrelated regression only. Uh, so please bear with me with that with that method. Um, and again, we perform a little bit more of um, testing on, on these methods, um, and 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 similarly to uh, to what we expected, um, we sort of found that the, the interaction is is very important. Otherwise, you get bias when you have informative cluster size. And the multi-level model performs best. And you can see that the, the two-stage bootstrap plus seemingly unrelated regression doesn't really add anything compared to seemingly unrelated regression alone. Um, particularly in confidence interval coverage is, is about the same. And under under below 0 0.9, so under coverage. So, um, so it doesn't, doesn't really help much. Um, a bit better root mean square error, but it might, uh, it's, it's not even uh, much. So, um, so is, and, and the, the, um, the, the variance is also uh, very similar. So, so uh, I think at the end, we concluded that, uh, or we recommended multi-level models um, only uh, when you have covariate adjustment being needed because the two-stage bootstrap wasn't doing a good job as, as expected. Right, last point um, on, on missing data. Um, and, and again, we, we uh, were driven by uh, by, by, by the, the, the empirical studies um, and in all of them, the, there was a lot of missing data in both costs and, and outcomes. Um, and, and the main concern is obviously that the individuals with uh, missing observations might be systematically different from those with complete data. And in, the, in this cluster trial setting, um, what we uh, we were recommending is that the missing data analysis must recognize the hierarchical structure of the data, not only because of the study design itself that you should respect, but also th that the probability of observing the data might actually be more similar within clusters, and so you should recognize that. Um, we saw built on multiple imputation methods just because they've been widely used for addressing the missing data in economic evaluation. And for those that are not familiar with multiple imputation, the basic idea is to uh, fill in each of the obs missing observations uh, with many imputed values uh, to account for the uncertainty associated um, with the missing data. And to impute those values, you need to sort of specify an imputation model. And all we sort of did here was to de develop and, and sort of extend a multi-level multiple imputation uh, approach um, to recognize the clustering. So here's an example of a sort of what we would call a single level or a standard multiple imputation model for cost effectiveness analysis, where you have a sort of a joint model of costs and outcomes, um, and you impute the values based on, on this model, which includes um, predictors at the individual level X, but also at the cluster level, if, if it needs um, be. Uh, so for example, you might imagine that the sum of cluster specific characteristics might influence uh, the completion of questionnaires. So you can include those cluster uh, level uh, variables in the invitation model. And, and so this, this joint model recognize again, the correlation between costs and effects. Um, and even this approach might account for some of the between cluster variation because we are including cluster level uh, predictors of missingness, um, but is unlikely to explain all the, the, the sort of within cluster dependence. And that's why we need multi-level MI. So the multi-level MI is basically um, transporting that sort of multi-level model to the imputation step 
uh, in addition to your substantive model. Um, and, and so you've seen this before, it's just a multi-level, a two-level uh, model um, and is jointly uh, estimated. So unfortunately, uh, state uh, hasn't invested in, in uh, the multi-level multiple imputation. And so if you want to, to implement um, multi-level multiple imputation, it has to be through R. Um, I, I run a, a annual uh, short course on, on missing data and, and what I usually do, we, we call R from state for those that don't want to go into R. And, and there's a little bit of code that just opens R, run the codes and goes back to state. Um, obviously that sort of limits what you can do with a multi-level multi-imputation, but is, is sort of a shortcut um, for those that don't want to go into R. Um, but these days there's increasingly use um, of this software. So it should be uh, familiar for most of you. Um, and, and without wanting to go again a lot in detail, um, we, we did some further testing comparing the single level with a multi-level MI. And this is just a snapshot of two scenarios. Um, there were many more uh, in, in this paper. Um, but, but basically what we found and not surprisingly was a multi-level MI um, with informative cluster size, um, um, you was not only getting uh, the, the right um, standard errors, but also um, point estimates that were closer to the truth, um, unlike single level MI, which was leading to bias results and underestimating uncertainty. So I, I should note that this obviously was a case where we have uh, informative cluster size. Usually if you're not having cl uh, informative cluster size, then the implications of uh, using single level MI is similar to the implications of using uh, normal, sort of uh, ignoring the clustering, so to speak, uh, at the, um, the analysis stage. Um, in other words, mostly reflected in the estimation of the confidence intervals. But because we have informative cluster size here incorporated, then um, not using a multi-level approach uh, affected both the bias and the precision. And that's it. I'm just um, finishing with, with some related developments that you might want to uh, to, to look at, such as the use of Bayesian hierarchical models on top of the three set of models um, that we, um, we covered. And, and this is basically a, a multi-level model, but estimated from a Bayesian perspective. Then we have other study uh, using more complex variance structures and no normal multi-level models. And, and also another study comparing um, random effects versus fixed effects um, for uh, in the context of missing data. And that's it. Um, open for, for questions, I guess. Mm, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. That was uh, absolutely terrific. There's a couple of questions in the chat, and I think Richard's going to uh, go through those. Absolutely. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. So, th thank you, Mama. That was that was a really interesting uh, 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 coverage of the of the work you, you and others have been doing in the area. And it's not something that I uh, engage with as much as I should. And I think the 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 um, empirical results that you showed that it actually does matter both for precision and for for um, uh, uncertainty is is really it's really valuable. So, thank you for that. Um, we, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, and maybe I can ask the people who uh, pose them in the chat to to uh, switch on their their microphone and their video and uh, and and ask the question. So, uh, Sergey, if you're around and want to ask your question, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, hi. Can you can you hear me? 
can you yes, hear me? Yes, can, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm actually, um, let me actually ask a different question. Um, I'm, I'm sort of doing the clustering um, yeah, evaluation of a trial, and I, I'm, one question that bothers me the most is, how do you perform a, a balanced, balancedness test uh, for, for uh, clustered trials? You know, so when you regress a treatment dummy um, on covariates and with expectation to um, have uh, regressions that doesn't predict the treatment, because when you, so what's the, how do you, uh, what's the, you know, the most sort of the best way to do that? Thanks. So I think you, um, you were alluding to the, the, the balance between the covariates. So basically the, it's the standard, standard test of randomization, which you would see um, in just, you know, just to affirm that the design has succeeded in the randomization. Yeah, Normally, yeah, you yeah. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so usually, and, and this is not um, something specific to cluster trials, um, we, we usually uh, adopt standardized mean difference from the causal inference literature. Um, so, and, and there's, there's usually some, some, some rules of thumb um, for standardized mean difference that are less than 0 0.1 that are sort of acceptable. Um, and I think that that's one of the ways to look at. Is there any um, way you can specify what you mean exactly? And uh, what do you mean exactly? What, which regression so, do you run, which model? So, so basically what I'm trying to say is that, imagine that you have a cluster trials and, and you suspect of imbalances and you want to uh, sort of double check whether the randomization actually worked, um, then what I would suggest is that you compute for each of the, your key uh, prognostic factors um, or baseline covariates as, as, um, to, to, to perform those standardized mean difference. Basically, they, they, they sort of assess the, the, the balance and the difference between, um, uh, between arms with respect to those variables. Um, and then apply some, some established rules in the sense that if those differences are below 10%, um, um, then, then, then you're probably uh, happy with, with going ahead with, uh, with, with the design and the randomization, um, basically with, with the balance that between the, the baseline covariates um, if not, then then you, uh, you you might decide to adjust for for those baseline uh, covariates as part of your analysis. I mean, I, I might be missing what you're trying to uh, to. Um, um, but that's okay. So I was just so I just how to use, let's say that you need to um, you know see if the randomization succeeded. And normally, if it was a individual level randomization, you would just regress covariates on the, on the treatment dummy, co treatment dummy on covariates. But in the clusters, you get significance because uh, the randomization is on the cluster level. And so, that, so what, what I'm I... trying to say, Sergey, if you do that, yes, I mean, good. usually we discourage that because it is relied on, on the sample size. So what you were saying about regressing the, the, the covariates on the dummy variable, it depends on the sample size because you're going to look at p-values and things. So the standardized mean difference he, uh, he doesn't depend on the sample size. That, that's the, the, the great thing about standardized mean differences is that you can do that. It's basically that, but not dependent on sample size. So it's, it's invariant to sample size. And, and that's, that is great. So, so in that case, and, and that stems from causal inference in general, we don't wanna look at p-values. We don't wanna rely on them. Um, we want to look at actually the difference and then how sizable they are. And, and you know, usually you want them to be very close to zero, but I think there's some understanding in the literature that as long as they're below 10% or 0.1, um, the people are relatively comfortable with those, although I think in, 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 um, in ideal uh, scenarios, you want them to be very close to zero. And, and there is an alternative to what you're saying, uh, to, to th that type of regression, but without sort of going to uh, uh, the sort of areas of um, should we look at p-values or not.
Um, so so have, have a look at standardized mean difference in general, uh, and I think it'll, it will help you. And then that's what I probably would recommend people use in this setting as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks for the question, Sergey. Thanks, thanks for the response, Noma. Uh, Rachel. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I have a, a cluster randomized control trial um, that I'll be analyzing soon. And one of the things that uh, concerns me with how it's all turned out is that there's uh, quite a difference in the number of participants within each cluster. Um, so I'm not talking about cluster sizes in terms of the number there are, you know, um, over 100 clusters. So we're okay there. But within each cluster, um, we might have 10 patients or we might have 150 patients. And uh, one of the design factors within uh, the trial setup was to stratify. Um, so it's a stratification factor for cluster size, less than 50 patients and, and 50 or more. So I'm just wondering how stratification um, plays into uh, the analysis when we're looking at, I guess, you know, the correlation between costs and benefits at the cluster level, whether you need to do anything differently in your multi-level model, and uh, yeah, and whether you think that stratification is, you know, um, going to be enough uh, in itself, or whether it's something we should be thinking about stratifying for other important um, you know, patient characteristics. Can I clarify what was the reason for the stratification in first place? Uh, yes, that it was harder to get a uh, metropolitan and country sort of like rural unit breakdown because that's what we considered would be this would be the uh, the reason in that you know patients may be different, costs certainly would be different. Um, so we went with unit size. Okay, so, so the, the, there was a concern that th those areas might be uh, very different and, uh, and, and that uh, in terms of recruitment as well. So the first thing I should say, Rachel, is that, you know, one, one of the strengths of the multi-level model is because it's sort of apply this, sh this shrinkage to, um, to the cluster specific estimates. So if you have clusters with small sizes like 10 and others very big, what the multi-level does is to sort of borrow information from those bigger clusters to calculate those cluster specific effects for those clusters that only have a few individuals. I think 10 is not too problematic. What we found in the simulations is that you know, anything above 10 or above is, is okay, unless you, you really have a, a small number like two or three or, or just a handful of individuals might become a bit more problematic for um, the, 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 the random effects model. Um, but because of this shrinkage and, and borrowing information from bigger clusters to estimate smaller clusters is usually not a problem uh, in terms of the estimation itself. Now, because you have applied uh, stratification from at the design stage, uh, so it's part of the design itself, then I think the multi-level model will have to uh, sort of be consistent with that. And, and by that, I mean, if, if you want then to do those sort of, uh, um, to, to stratify the multi-level model according to those variables, um, then it probably would be the, the most appropriate thing to do. Not because probably the multi-level model wouldn't handle those differences in the cluster size, um, but because it's just about being consistent between what you sort of pre-specified at the design level and analysis. Um, the other thing, now that you, you sort of mentioned the issue, the other thing that you should look into, and, and I think because you, you suspected of that, is once you do the uh, stratification, do you sort of eliminate all sort of informative cluster size? Mm -hmm. okay. so, so, so you should, should look at those um, associations and see if, if there's any differential by treatment arm, because if there isn't, then it's all looked after um 
by by the multi-level model but if it's not then you might want to uh, um to elaborate uh, on on your analysis for example with an interaction term sure hoping fingers crossed it is uh, balanced between intervention and control but we'll see yeah okay thanks very much thank you rachel um we've got five minutes left in the session uh and there, there's time for one more question if anybody wants to ask manuel anything while we have him here Happy to stay a, a bit more if, if, the, if there's questions. That's no problem. I think your uh, presentation must have been so clear that you've exhausted all <laughs> possible angles, you know. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Maybe it, the end of the day for you and, and the all <laughs> <old> time. <laughs> so personally, just say thank you so much for for, for uh, presenting at this inaugural meeting. And I'd like to hand back over to, to Rachel to close the, the session off. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And uh, thanks very much. Uh, it was, um, yeah, it was, I think, you know, pitched at just, just the right level and uh, particularly informative. Um, so yes, thank you. I uh, would like to now bring the meeting to a close. Um, uh, possibly people may wish to, you know, email you specifically about, you know, questions in any of your uh, papers. Um, and uh, we're very pleased that you uh, allowed us to record the session as well, um, which will be made available for the participants today. Um, so that's terrific. Uh, we plan uh, the next seminar will be in two months. We're just uh, confirming the next speaker uh, and topic. Um, but I think that this is, you know, extremely helpful for Australian health economists who, um, you know, are working sometimes uh, in very small groups, sometimes on their own in terms of, uh, you know, weeding through the more uh, complex uh, and interesting methodological issues, uh, particularly with uh, regards to data analysis. So, yeah, once again, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to ACTA uh, for hosting um, and to Michael for uh, setting this up and uh, really appreciate uh, everybody's time um, and input for questions and uh, especially to our guest presenter today. So we wish you a very good day. Hope you've uh, you've kicked it off with a, you know, a power breakfast and uh, yeah, we'll see you again soon, I'm sure, at uh, an international meeting. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.